Chuck, it's great to see you today. Thanks, Jason. Good to be here. Chuck, you're a squadron leader in Navy SEAL Team 6, and so you know the ins and outs of war pretty well, and you obviously know the war in Ukraine really well, as you followed it daily since before it even began. So let me ask you, what's going on now in cursed Oblast, Russia? Well, uh, Vladimir Putin, of course, this is, this is quite literally a thorn in his side. Uh, he has, at this point, assembled a, a force of about 50,000 troops. That's give or take two, maybe three divisions, depending on how big your divisions are. This is a significant uh, military effort for him. Uh, one of the reasons Ukraine invaded Kursk was to divert Russian resources away from the east. Uh, the Russians didn't do that. Surprisingly, what they did is they assembled new units. Uh, so here's the good news. Those units have minimal combat experience. And as we've seen from the, from the captures that have occurred in Kursk Oblast, we're talking about 17 and 18 year old kids who have very abbreviated military training. Uh, they are leavened, if you want to say this, with North Korean forces as well. Uh, it is not the broadest consensus in the media now, but among my friends and analysts, we are virtually certain that North Korean forces have entered into combat in Kursk. Uh, what we can expect and what we've seen from other places on the battlefield, when you have undertrained Russian troops led uh, with, uh, what, well, let me put it this way, the quality of Russian leadership throughout this war is pretty abysmal. So we are going to see, and we have seen, high casualty Russian operations in Kursk. And I would also remind everyone that Ukraine invaded Kursk back in August, and they have not been leaning on their shovels. They have been digging in for defensive positions and winter quarters. So it's going to take the Russians a very long time to get Kursk back from the Ukrainians. But when I look to the east, it doesn't look like things are going great for Russia there either. In fact, it doesn't look like things are going great for Russia most anywhere. But what do you see going on in the east? Well, what, what's interesting is around Pokrovsk, uh, it's too soon to say that the Russian forces have culminated here. But what I do know is this. They haven't made any substantial progress towards that city. There are a couple of places between uh, Pokrovsk and Kurakove where the Russians have advanced on some very narrow salience. But for example, around Kurakove, the Ukrainians have, I, I list contact points on my maps, there are Ukrainian troops in contact three, four, even five kilometers east of the zero line. So is, uh, the zero line seems to be rather permeable here. But what I could say for the Ukrainians is they're kicking Russian butt in the rear, literally in the Russian rear. Uh, there is a, one alarming development here, uh, not alarming, but not surprising. Uh, Russia has started a series of glide bomb attacks on the dam to the western side of the Karakove Reservoir. Uh, should this succeed in breaching the reservoir, uh, we're going to be looking at some catastrophic flooding, and that may or may not influence uh, positions that Ukraine has south of the water course, but we're keeping an eye on that. They say that Russia recently has been desperate to send in higher volumes of people. We saw that in the Kursk Oblast, Vladimir Putin demanded that Kursk be liberated by October 1st. Now, that deadline's been missed. His birthday, October 7th, also was missed. And I heard that they're setting now a new deadline. But in all cases, it seems to me that Putin is keen to show Trump and the Americans that he's serious and he's not going to slow down. What do you think about all this? Well, it's a good thing Vladimir is not running for re-election because the Ukrainians have seized 1,000 square kilometers of Russia, which is all, all summer. 
right? So this is a problem. And I would just say that uh, Russia's deadline for removing Ukraine from Kursk, I'd say that's a bit aspirational. The Ukrainians have dug in. They have prepared winter quarters. And also, and more significantly, Ukraine's ground lines of communication and supply, they are secure. This isn't the sort of pocket that's going to collapse suddenly. So Ukraine can fight in Kursk pretty much as long as they want to. And therefore, I see the opportunity of fighting uh, an attritional battle in, in Kursk. And it's going to be costly for the Russians. It would seem that Russia is becoming increasingly worried about this war. And worried, I mean by nobody wants to join the army anymore. You've seen that they're offering $20,000, $30,000 to join the military. Keep in mind, a teacher in Russia might only make $500 a month or even less. But more than that, they're recruiting men who are over 70 years old to go serve the military at the front. Overall, the situation for Russia looks pretty bad. I don't see much good coming out of there. And now that we've seen what they've been saying recently in Moscow, it appears to me that they're concerned what the Americans might do next as well. If you sign that contract to join the Russian military, you're dead. Let's, let's, let's do the numbers. 400,000 Russian troops invaded Ukraine. 700,000 Russian troops are casualties now. So virtually the entire invasion force has been, have become casualties and almost double that amount. And you sign that contract, you're in for the duration, right? So that 70 year old guy, uh, you know, the life expectancy of a Russian soldier in the Ukraine war, it rarely goes above six months. So Instead, you might as well volunteer for pancreatic cancer instead of the Russian military. But one thing I wanted to ask you, it, there are dynamics now moving in Russia. I'd like to know, I, I've heard rumblings of political discontent, but, but also the, how difficult it is for Putin now to continue selling this war at home. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Vladimir Putin is facing a lot of problems back home. The biggest problem he's facing is the Russian economy. Real inflation is well above 28%, many economists say. In addition to that, oil prices are dropping. Putin for a long time has feared that there'd be a, a strong decrease in prices because less than $72 per barrel already means that the budget of Russia will not be balanced. But looking at current estimates, looking at where the oil's headed in the next few months, it appears that oil might come as low as $50 a barrel, which means the ruble would have to be devaluated to about 122 to 135 to the US dollar. Currently, it's about 100 to the dollar. So imagine the average Russian citizen. You've lost 22 to 35% of your money due to devaluation. You're losing at least another 27, 28% due to inflation. And the average Russian person spends more than 50% of their money just on food. In comparison, the average European only spends about 15%. So in total, the money that would have usually gone towards food is now just disappearing as the Russian ruble loses value. Now, I don't think that Vladimir Putin cares at all about his own people, but what he does care about is his stability. And you know that you have a population that has hunger, that opens the door for somebody else to take advantage of it. Somebody else to swoop in to take advantage of the misery and try to take power. And once again, I don't think anyone would take power in Russia out of the goodness of their heart. Rather, it's a calculated decision. Now is the time to strike and become the new czar. And is that possible? Most certainly. Russian history, more than other countries, shows a, I would say, almost propensity for leaders to try to overtake the ones that are in front of them and to take their spot. And as that goes on, I think there's a good chance that we could see significant events within Russia that could dramatically end this war in a matter of hours or days at most. But how do you look at the situation? Well, you know, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, dictatorships like this are always completely state. Two, two of the most ruthless, bloodthirsty dictators of the 20th century, Ceausescu and Gaddafi, they got up that morning, had their coffee, signed the death warrants, and went out to give a speech. And 12 hours later, one was being pulled out of a gutter under a road, and the other guy uh, was up against a wall 
after a people's tri tribunal. So things in these dictatorships can fly apart very quickly. And, you know, you are a student of Russian history. Look, military defeat and hunger are the handmaidens of regime change in Russia, and they always have been. I, I'd like to ask you a question about you know, one one of the one of the things I always thought that that NATO could be doing better, the EU, is enforcing the oil sanctions. And as we speak right now, there are Russian shadow fleet tankers off the coast of Greece, transshipping their oil into uh, you know flags of convenience. If that loophole is closed, if we can get Greece on board, if we can get India back in in our orbit do you see that accelerating the economic misery and perhaps political instability in russia is that a good idea or not a good idea absolutely anything that we can do to strike the russian oil and gas industry is key oil and gas make up 40 to 50 percent of the russian national budget now even easier is that you ukraine if it had the authorization which the us has refused to give it or if it just didn't worry anymore about the authorization as the current U.S. president is on the way out, so they have little to risk, could easily attack one of the eight major ports from which, which Russia exports nearly all of its oil. Now imagine that. Destroy a few ports. They have values of billions of dollars, take years to rebuild, and in the wintertime, there won't be much rebuilding. That could set Russia back in ways that will affect it for years and years to come. There's a lot that we could done right now to really damage Russia. Increasing sanctions, enforcing sanctions, and getting rid of these fleets that we know are operating illegally could really change the outcome of the war. What else do you see going on right now? Well, you know, it's interesting to me when we see these long range strikes carried out by Ukraine, it always underscores to me the fact that no NATO weapons have been provided to Ukraine that are capable of carrying out strikes 600, 700, even 1,000 miles deep in, into Russia. Ukraine has had to hand fabricate these weapons, create that capability. So using what is certainly by NATO standards, very primitive technology, they are able to carry out strikes against Russian airfields, against oil refineries, against deep strategic targets. But their hands are tied, right? If they are allowed, for example, to prosecute targets of Russian bombers squirting wing loads of cruise missiles at Ukrainian cities, they should be, uh, those are legitimate military targets. They should be able to hit them and there is NATO technology we could provide for that defensive capability. That's just one among dozens of weapon systems that should be made available to them. But uh, I am ever hopeful. <laughs> well, Chuck, you and I remain ever hopeful. And soon, let's hope we see Ukraine's victory. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for your service. Thank you, Jason.